Hi everyone, this is Dr. Tim Clinton, Executive Director of the James Dobson Family Institute and President of the American Association of Christian Counselors. Wanting to take just a brief moment to let you know that we love, appreciate, and are praying for you. Our entire team here at Family Talk is doing that very thing. And we also wanted to encourage you, if you're struggling or you could use some encouragement, to feel free to call us and pray with us. Our toll-free number is 877 877- 732-6825. That number again is 877-732-6825. Or you could also connect with us online at drjamesdobson.org. Thanks for letting us be a part of your life every day. Uh, we are going to get through this. Dr. Dobson said we are going to get through this challenging time and we're going to do it together. Let's go now to our regular programming. While most of us are practicing social distancing and working remotely these days, the medical community is different. They are tirelessly working to fight the COVID-19 outbreak. Every day, hospital staffs across the nation are logging long hours to treat those with the coronavirus. And today here on Family Talk, we're going to continue Dr. Dobson's recent conversation with ER doctor Eric Axine. Yesterday, Dr. Axine shared his perspective on this growing pandemic and talked about the taxing schedule that he personally has endured. In just a moment, he'll address the mental and emotional toll that COVID-19 has taken on doctors and nurses worldwide. Dr. Axine will also provide helpful tips for what the public can do to combat this outbreak. There's a lot of content to get to, so let's get started. Here again is Dr. James Dobson on this special edition of Family Talk. I know that the tensions are very high for families during this crisis, and our hearts go out to those of you who have lost a loved one, perhaps, or a close friend, and you're quarantined. That's also terribly difficult for families, especially those with children. Uh, I'm hearing about that. The kids are designed to run and play, and They really don't do very well when they're boxed in. In fact, I don't think there's been an upheaval quite like this one uh, since World War II. Now, maybe that's an overstatement. (laughs) Every generation has its challenges. Nevertheless, we know God is in control and that he hears our plaintive cries. Our Family Talk team is monitoring issues related to the virus, and we're going to talk with our listeners today about one of the most urgent. I have great concerns for the medical people who are literally risking their lives to minister to suffering patients. We must be in daily prayer for these exhausted caregivers And I want to talk to Dr. Eric Axine. He's a medical director for several municipalities in the Dallas area. Dr. Axine was designated Physician of the Year by the largest physicians group in the United States. This is just a short summary of a very impressive bio. You know, I read a statement this last week uh, written by a physician who described her work during this crisis as being rather like a combat situation. Veterans tell us that uh, when frontline soldiers and Marines are dying all around, uh, they report a sense of of camaraderie and love for each other. I'm told that at that point, they're not really fighting for their country. That may not sound patriotic, but that's it. They're not fighting for their country. They're They become a band of brothers, and they're fighting for each other. What would you say to the people who are listening to us right now? Many of them, I would think, are in tears, and I have been. And my heart goes out to hundreds of thousands of sick and dying patients in third world countries where they don't have modern hospitals or ventilators or trained medical responders. They're on their own. This is a profound human tragedy. I agree. It really, like I said earlier, just unprecedented. I think it may be what we're experiencing. I, 
You know, though, I, I've been touched by the sadness of some stories that have really uh, brought reality for me. I, a friend of mine, my roommate in college, just lost his wife a month ago today. And um, to hear his sadness and to hear um, him grieving um, over his, the loss of his wife. And uh, as I was on the phone with him um, before this call, actually, uh, the sadness that I feel when dad with his children in tow uh, in the waiting room are asking me when they can come back and see their mommy. And I know that she just died. Um, is one of the most heartbreaking things I have to do as a physician. And when I'm encountered with stories like this, it really makes me very, very thankful for what I have. I'm very grateful. I used to think that my faith was mature, but as I've encountered this, this, uh, this pandemic, I've found uh, new ways of, of deepening my faith and, and drawing closer to Christ. For that, I've been very grateful and thankful. Eric, tell people how they can pray for healthcare workers at this time. Well, I guess I would want my colleagues to know um, we have uh, the many, many Christian physicians out there, including myself and a, a small group of physicians in our ER. Four or five of us meet together to pray um, for physicians and PAs, healthcare workers all across our country. Um, I would want um, people to know, um, healthcare workers, um, that they are being prayed for. I would want to also encourage um, any layperson. Um, there is something that you can do. You can stay at home. You can you can social distance. You know, washing your hands, uh, not touching your face. Um, you know, these these are things that we can all do. We can do our part to help to flatten this curve. And if we flatten this curve, then there'll be fewer people hurt by that surge. What do you say to people who absolutely refuse to quarantine themselves? You know, there are people walking around just as the kids were on spring break a few weeks ago who foolishly ignored the warnings of their leaders. What they don't realize is that even if they don't become ill, they might carry the virus home to mom or dad or grandma. That's absolutely right. We really have to take it seriously. There are a lot of people who are. Um, either minimizing it or maybe they're even fatalistic where they just say, hey, I'm going to get infected anyway, but uh, hey, I'm young and healthy. I'm not going to die. And they forget that they're a fomite. They are uh, a, uh, a source of transmission to more vulnerable people. Um, and it's so important that they comply. There's a lot of very smart people out there that are making these recommendations and we need to listen. We'll talk, Eric, about the way this virus appears to differ from SARS or the swine flu or other epidemics, uh, which seem to target children and young people. You know, I was reading yesterday the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 and 1919 killed more than 500 million people. That's one third of the world's entire population. Many of them were young soldiers who had just fought and somehow managed to survive World War I. But we're told that COVID appears to be targeting older people instead of the young. Do we know why? Yeah, that's a good question. I know that um, it's all about risk stratification. And, and uh, the, um, the older you are, the, the, the greater the risk is. And then by adding comorbidities, it's like adding oil to a fire. So what's happening to these folks, um, young and old, actually, is uh, that uh, you, you'll get the virus. And once you become symptomatic, about a week later, you either get better or you get worse. And we're seeing mortality rates of people on ventilators as high as 86 percent. Once they get to the ventilator, it's... Uh, Wait, did you say that those that are on ventilators tend not to survive? No, they don't. And uh, the, the mortality rates are very high when patients get intubated or they're placed on a ventilator. The, the body's immune system um, fights it and they get a... It's, a, it's called a cytokine storm and... Uh, um, the organs, uh, systems fail, and uh, there's really not a lot um, we can do to maximize our care that we can deliver to our patient populations. So we really have to 
do our part and do what we can do to flatten the curve so we don't get to a place where we can't deliver the care that we, we want to deliver. Actually, this has been a really neat thing for me to see. I reached out to the, the home builder that built my home to ask if he could help me build some plexiglass, uh, plexiglass intubation boxes. And uh, right now, as we speak, my uh, home builder is uh, not building homes. He's building intubation boxes for me, my hospital, firefighters, to more safely put people on ventilators. And uh, it has been really neat to see the innovation and ingenuity of other Christians here and other uh, walks of life helping me as a physician. Uh, it's basically a, a, a plexiglass box that goes over the patient to uh, decrease the transmission of coronavirus. And I could tell you many more stories, Dr. Dobson, of other people using their 3D printers to make me valves for PPE that are out of stock and they're bringing them to the ER. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been a, a really neat thing to see God using us. I, uh, we, one of my colleagues started a, uh, an organization, a nonprofit called Mission Regan, where he collects expired medical devices. And uh, they've been distributing it all over the country to help people. And, uh, and it's, a, it's an amazing ministry that has brought so much good um, from, uh, from expired medical supplies now saving lives. It's really neat. Uh, we have several more minutes, and I'd like to focus them on you. You and Deborah have two children. Uh, tell us about them. Uh, my daughter, Emily, is nine, and my son, Ben, is 14. You mentioned earlier that they're quarantined. Are you able to hold them and be with them, have breakfast with them and touch them? Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, I really uh, miss hugging them. We, we do have something that we do, though, um, just for some physical contact, is uh, we uh, will back up into each other and kind of nuzzle our backs together a little bit. <laughs> it's a silly thing that we do. But, you know, I'd like to share with you something my daughter did. Uh, she's in third grade. And she, on her own, got her friends together. They started their own little Bible study to pray for people. That is precious. Dr. Dobson, it is the most special thing I, I may have ever seen. And I know that God is looking down on her and her friends with such a big smile. It is so precious seeing them work through scripture verses and praying for each other and their friends. And it is a, the most beautiful thing ever. And you know what? Had this coronavirus thing not happened, do you th I, I don't know that she would have done that. I, I just I think I've seen wonderful things happen in my kiddos' lives, and this is one of the most precious. Are they able to get out with their friends? I know it's very difficult for young children, particularly, uh, to not be able to get out and run and be with their friends. My daughter is better with technology at age nine than I am at age 45. Uh, she's, um, she actually uses Zoom. Um, to communicate with her friends. Um, she still goes to her ballet classes via Zoom in the front foyer of our home. Uh, they're finding ways to, to interact with one another. And I'll tell you what, I, I think these little kids have anxiety about this too. I know my daughter does. And I'm so proud of her that she's reaching out to Christ with her young faith. It's beautiful. That is so touching. I wish I could hear them. Tell us about your son, Benjamin. I know he's 14 years old and he's a freshman in high school. What else would you tell us? Well, uh, my son, Ben, is worried about his dad. He's worried that uh, I am uh, going to get sick and uh, die. And uh, those are very real fears for him. And, uh, you know, these conversations have led now to him and I walking through via FaceTime um, we're walking through uh, the uh, spiritual disciplines by Richard Foster, and and it's been a real encouragement to me to see him growing in his faith right now as we walk through the um, this book as a devotional together. And uh, so he is really growing so fast in his faith with Christ. Uh, I'm so proud of him and my daughter Emily. I um, and that this coronavirus has been a time of refinement for them. And I think that they're really responding well. Dr. Axine, it's obvious that you have a great heart for the Lord. And that's what I love about you. May I ask you to close our program today by praying not only for Americans, but for the sick and dying people around the world? It would be a pleasure to pray. Uh, can I ask you how we can pray for you, Dr. Dobson, in your ministry? 
Thank you, Eric. Uh, Shirley and I are sequestered and have been for several weeks in what I call my little writing condo in California. I've been working on a new book and have been since even before the pandemic. So we think we have had minimal exposure to this virus, but who knows? Uh, We rarely go out except to walk the streets to get exercise. There are very few people out there now because they're trying to protect themselves too. So we stay away from each other. So I thank people for praying for us. Because of our ages, we are at higher risk, I suppose. I would also like our listeners to pray for our staff in Colorado Springs. They're working at home and We're determined to be able to continue their salaries through this economic downturn. I also hope, and I want to stress this, I hope our friends will pray for our president and his medical team because I've been close enough to that to know that they're under enormous pressure today. The media and other critics don't make it any easier. I plead with our listeners to pray for America's health care providers because they are literally putting their lives on the line every day. There is so much to pray for. Well, uh, I'll, uh, I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, all-powerful God, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to, uh, to serve you. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be a physician in such a time as this. I pray for all of my physician brothers and sisters throughout the country. I pray, Father, for strength for them uh, and peace. Um, Father, I ask for wisdom uh, for healthcare workers, researchers, um, in development of cures and vaccines. I pray uh, your anointing upon them. Uh, Father, I ask for um, a peace that surpasses understanding uh, for for patients and for people across this country who may be sequestered from their friends and family, uh, for patients who are in the hospital right now listening to this, I pray for healing. Father, I I pray that your spirit would uh, spread throughout this country faster than the virus. And Father, as uh, we shut down borders here uh, uh, and we uh, uh, limit travel and isolate, Uh, I pray that your spirit would just spread and shatter these barriers. And uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring the healing that we really need through Christ. Father, I I thank you for the ministry of Dr. James Dobson. I pray that uh, you keep him healthy and and safe uh, in California as he writes this book. I pray that those words would be anointed and and bring healing. Um, Father, I ask too for prayer for uh, our leaders. Um, Father, pray for President Trump. Uh, You'd strengthen him and uh, give him wisdom, surround him with wisdom uh, as he makes decisions. Um, Father, I ask uh, for prayer for families right now who are separated. Um, uh, I pray for uh, uh, peace for them as well. And Father, as we close this interview, I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that you would look on us and be full of, of joy as you see your, uh, your children serving you and bringing you glory in loving one another and sharing your love, sharing the cross. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Dr. Eric, that was a beautiful prayer. Uh, this has been a very meaningful time for me. I've enjoyed talking to you, even though the topic is so disturbing. Well, we're going to have to wrap it up because our time is gone. Uh, We've been talking for the last two days with Dr. Eric Axine, who is the medical director at Medical City Hospital in McKinney, Texas. If you've missed either of these discussions or would like to hear them again, go to drjamesdobson.org and click on the broadcast page. You didn't really have time to be with us because you needed your rest today after being up all night. But what you've had to say will be appreciated by our listeners. And I hope it'll motivate many, many people to be praying about various aspects of this epidemic. Dr. Dobson, I I do love you like a brother. If there's ever anything I can do to serve you, you just let me know. God be with you, my friend.
heartfelt and relevant conversation about the unprecedented times we're living in right now. You've been listening to Dr. James Dobson's two-part conversation with Dr. Eric Axine here on Family Talk. We ask that you join with us and continue to pray for the brave medical personnel everywhere. They are continuously putting themselves in harm's way to care for those who are sick. Visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org to learn more about Dr. Eric Axine or to request a copy of this entire interview. Again, that's Dr. JamesDobson.org, and then tap on today's broadcast page. If you yourself are in need of prayer, please know that we are always here for you. Call 877-732-6825, and a member of our team will be happy to take the time to talk with you and pray with you. Again, that number is 877-732-6825. Through these difficult times, please remember that the James Dobson Family Institute is here for you. Thank you for joining us for the past couple of days here on Family Talk. For the remainder of this week, we're going to revisit a classic broadcast about adult children of alcoholics. We know this is a difficult subject to discuss, but we also know it will speak to millions of people in our listening family. That's all coming up on the next edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks for listening. Have a safe and blessed day. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Someone once said, if you remove the rocks from a brook, it would lose its song. Well, that holds true for you and me as well. Author Scott Walker tells of the time he was asked to help some friends dig through the ashes of their house after a fire. When they arrived, all that was standing was a portion of the outer brick wall. Where the piano once stood lay only a pile of ashes and twisted wire. Nothing had survived the blaze. But while sifting through the debris, Walker came across a tiny china bluebird. He wiped away the soot to find that the colors were still bright. A few hairline cracks had formed in the glaze, but beyond that, it remained intact. Walker writes, As I gazed down at the bird's small beak and two black eyes, I wanted to weep. If only this little bluebird could talk, what a story it would tell. A story of the heat of the night, of terror, of survival against great odds. And then the crucial question hit me. Why did this China bluebird survive? It had survived the fire because it had been tested by fire. And so it is with human beings who have been refined in life's raging furnace. They are tougher, harder and more resilient than those who have never faced difficulty and loss. That understanding may help us cope the next time the heat is turned up on our tranquil little world. To find out how you can partner with Family Talk, go to drjamesdobson.org. For over 40 years, Dr. James Dobson has been working to support the institution of the family. During that time, he's authored over 50 books, written hundreds of articles, broadcast thousands of radio shows, and produced many videos and films. Over the past few years, we've been busy digitizing and organizing Dr. Dobson's entire life's work to create a comprehensive library. And now you can personalize the Dobson Digital Library as your own. Getting started is easy. Want to find out ways to encourage your strong-willed child? Or perhaps you want to add some more romance into your marriage? Simply tap into the search bar. Thousands of related articles, broadcasts, books, and videos are at your fingertips. Want even more? You can save your favorite resources to your personal library by creating an account. We even give you the ability to save resources to view later. Like what you find? We make it easy to share with those you care about. It's as simple as that. Search, save, and share. With the Dobson Digital Library, thousands of resources on parenting, marriage, faith, and culture are at your fingertips. Getting started is only one click away. It used to be believed that most children were basically happy and carefree, but that's changing. Now we're seeing more signs of serious depression in children, even as young as five years old. Dr. James Dobson. 
for Family Talk. Depression in adults is hard to diagnose, and in children, it's even more difficult. In adults, the warning signs of depression include diminished energy, tiredness, fatigue, a general loss of interest in life, and sadness, crying, that low-down feeling. If a five to 10 year old is depressed, he may show signs of lethargy. He may not want to get out of bed in the morning. He may mope around. He may show no interest in things that would normally excite him. Sleep disturbances and stomach complaints are other warning signs. Another symptom can be open anger, hostility, and rage. He may lash out suddenly or unexpectedly at people or things around him. If you suspect your child is beginning to show the signs of depression, there are several things you should do. First, you should help put into words the feelings of the child and try to find an explanation for their sadness. Make yourself available to listen without judging or belittling the feelings expressed. Simply being heard can go a long way toward lifting a child's depression. Finally, I urge you to seek professional help if you feel the problem is out of hand. To get involved, go to drjamesdobson.org.